Hello again. Welcome to another installment of Talking Pictures. Today's episode is titled Seven Wonders of Engineering in Otago. I'm not saying these are necessarily the seven greatest feats of engineering in Otago, just seven of my favourites. And I've ordered them chronologically rather than ranking them in any order of significance. So here we go. Here's the oldest of my selection, the Ross Creek Waterworks. Not huge compared to the water supply systems of other cities of the world at that time, but it was New Zealand's first major urban water supply. Construction started in mid-1865, and it opened on the 9th of December, 1867. A half-day holiday was declared to allow people to witness the opening, and nearly 400 citizens were thought to have turned up. The opening didn't go as smoothly as they'd hoped, however. When they tested the supply a couple of days before the opening, a section of the 14-inch pipe that carried the water down alongside the water of Leith burst. They were hoping to get it fixed in time for the ceremony at two o'clock on opening day, but they were still working on it when two o'clock rolled around. And by quarter to three, they got tired of waiting and went ahead with the ceremony anyway, despite still not being able to pipe the water to town where the fire brigade was waiting in Duke Street to test the pressure. A temporary repair was finally made, and at quarter to six in the evening, the fire brigade finally got to conduct their test. The contractor who built the waterworks was David Proudfoot, whose name might be familiar to some of you as the man behind early railway and tramway projects in Dunedin. The waterworks was privately owned until the city took it over in 1875. A holiday was declared in Port Chalmers in July 1868 to allow people to attend the ceremony marking the start of construction of our second wonder, the Otago Graving Dock. Dignitaries from Dunedin arrived on the paddle steamer Golden Age. A procession, led by a band, marched down to the site. A contractor wheeled out a barrow onto the platform that had been laid between the shore and the deck of the steamer Tug Chalong. The wheelbarrow contained sodden earth and a Union Jack. The provincial superintendent, James McAndrew, tipped the barrow load out into the bay and the Union Jack popped up to mark the spot. Cannons went off and so on. When McAndrew spoke, he declared the project to be the greatest and most important work, either public or private, yet undertaken in the province. 90,000 cubic feet of dressed stone and 1,400 tonnes of Portland cement were used in constructing the graving dock, and up to 140 men at a time could be found working on it. It was formally opened in March 1872. Despite all the fanfare about it being the greatest and most important engineering project conducted in the province, by the 1890s it was already proving too small, and in 1905 work began. On a bigger replacement. In the 1880s, Dunedin born engineer George Smith Duncan instigated the use of cable cars in Dunedin. By October 1880, the braking system for his cable cars was ready for a test, so they built a ramp with rails in the yard of Cutton & Co, the foundry that was making the cars, so they could have a trial run. The ramp was 50 feet long, and had a gradient that was even steeper than the steepest part of the street it was designed to run on. If the brake failed and the car didn't stop, it would run off the end of the rails and crash. That didn't stop people wanting to hop on the car for the test run, and fortunately for them, the test went perfectly and the cableway went into operation about the beginning of 1881. However, in late April, the rope hauling one of the cars slipped out of its gripper on a curve and the car began to run away downhill. It had happened before. It was just a case of screwing on the brakes to make it stop. But the driver allegedly turned the brake screw the wrong way. The car shot to the bottom of the hill and rolled over. On the 5th of May, the most seriously injured of the passengers, Thomas Garrett, who jumped off the car as it hurtled downward, died from his injuries. A new emergency slot brake was designed to prevent such an accident happening again. And the innovations to make the cableway safer are an important part of what makes this my third wonder of engineering in Otago. 
The first sod of the Otago Central Railway was turned in 1879, but construction of the railway, dogged by the depression of the 1880s, was slow going at first. The first section of the railway, comprising just 27 kilometres of the eventual 235 kilometre total, didn't open to traffic until 1889. This first section included the 197 metre long and 47 metre high Wingatui Viaduct, which was formally opened in June 1887. The viaduct was said to be by far the largest viaduct in New Zealand and probably the largest in the Southern Hemisphere. It's also the largest iron structure in New Zealand. My fifth wonder is not a single piece of engineering. Instead, it's the many dredges that worked Otago's river terraces in search of gold. In the early 1880s, the engineering of gold dredging equipment had evolved to the production of steam dredges. From 1889 to 1891, there was a short-lived dredging boom following the success of Choi Suhoi's dredging venture on the Shotover River. A second bigger boom occurred in 1899-1900, sparked by the success of the Electric Gold Dredging Company. At the forefront of dredge construction were Dunedin engineering firms RS, Sparrow & Co, Kincaid & McQueen and A&T Burt, along with Christchurch firm Anderson & Co. The McGeorge brothers were the owners of several leading dredges during the second dredging boom. On the 12th of March 1898, the Governor, Lord Ranfurly, launched the pontoons for their third dredge, which was named Lady Ranfurly. The Lady Ranfurly went on to become the most successful of all Otago dredges. In July 1900, it won a re record weekly return of 1,234 ounces of gold, and in February 1904, raised the record to 1,265 ounces. It was one of the tallest buildings in New Zealand at the time of its opening in 1908. Seven storeys plus a basement, 103 feet tall from the pavement level. It was probably the first building in New Zealand to use a reinforced concrete raft foundation. More than 400 kilometres of steel reinforcing rods and wires weighing nearly 240 tonnes were used in its construction. Laid end on end, these rods and wires would just about stretch from Dunedin to Invercargill and back. One cubic yard of concrete was gauged, mixed, distributed and rammed into place every three minutes, which is why the New Zealand Express Company building, today known as Consultancy House, is my sixth wonder of engineering in Otago. During the 1920s, the Lake Coleridge Power Station in Canterbury could no longer keep up with increasing electricity demand in the South Island. So a site on the Waitaki River was chosen for a new hydro dam and electricity generating station. Construction began in 1928 and the official opening took place on the 27th of October 1934. This was the last dam constructed in New Zealand with pick and shovel. Over half a million cubic metres of material was excavated by hand in the course of construction. Between 1,000 and 1,230 workers were on site at any one time. To my mind, this engineering feat is our equivalent of the Empire State Building and the Sydney Harbour Bridge, both of which opened a couple of years earlier. And it's certainly a great example to round out my selection of seven wonders of engineering in Otago. Thanks for watching.